here today. Um, if you could all just hit mute, um, that would be great. Um, so for those of you who I haven't met in person yet, I'm Noaki Schwartz, and I'm your friendly Deputy Director for Communications, Environmental Justice, and Tribal Affairs. And I will be moderating um, our chat today. And Sarah Christie will be my wing woman. And Sarah, if you haven't met Sarah yet, thanks for waving. Um, she is our legislative director. So I just really want to thank everyone um, for taking the time to come today. I know it was late mailing and, and there was a lot on everyone's plate. Um, and today um, we are absolutely thrilled to be acknowledging the 50th anniversary of Prop 20. And we are so pleased to have panelists here with us today who were actually there when the movement to preserve California's coast began, one that you all know led to the creation of our agency. And um, to just kind of take you back a little bit, that was a time when the country felt a great sense of urgency to protect the planet and our coast. And that passionate protective spirit um, has really kind of run like a thread through our, our whole agency um, and, and has really been at the core of the commission's culture and mission from the very beginning. Um, before we get started, I just want to acknowledge for a moment that in the 50 years since our agency um, began, there have been all sorts of highs and lows, as you know, and while times have changed, we are in many ways in a very similar place today. So as you all know, in recent years, the commission gained the authority to consider the impact of proposed projects on environmental justice communities. And I really believe that this has reinvigorated our program in critical ways um, to have a more inclusive mission to really ensure that our decisions along the coast uh, truly include everyone. Um, the energy and the commitment to social justice that we see in many of our new staff today seems to echo the fire that burned in the hearts of the original coastal activists that we have with us today. And um, I think in ways large and small, EJ is a new frontier for us, but my hope is that, you know, together we will all continue to push the envelope for equity and see what else the Coastal Act can ultimately accomplish in the next 50 years. And with that, I'd like to introduce our panel. Um, and if each panelist um, could wave as I introduce you, that would be great. Um, so Warner Chabot, you're, you're up first. And Warner was a student organizer for the Prop 20 campaign and a central component, which was a central component of the statewide campaign, as you will hear. And he worked in the environmental space for most of his career, including as CEO for the California League of Conservation Voters, vice president of the Ocean Conservancy, and is now executive director of the San Francisco Estuary Institute. And the second person I'm going to introduce, many of you know well, Susan. If you could just wave your hand, there we are. Um, so Susan Hanch worked on Prop 20 as a volunteer. And as an aside, I just learned that she and Warner were classmates together at UC Santa Cruz. Um, and then Susan was hired as a student intern at the Coastal Commission in 1973. And that began her 43 year storied career at the commission that took her from an analyst to the head of the energy unit and Susan recently retired from her 20 year position as chief deputy and continues to be a valuable sounding board for us. Um, Lee, you're, you're up next. Lee, can you wave your hand? Lee sitting next to Linda. So Lee Otter started at the commission in 1973 as a planner on temporary loan from the National Park Service. And he worked extensively on the original coastal plan and the coastal acquisition priorities plan and after the Coastal Act passed in 1976, he decided to stay on with the commission permanently. Lee retired from the commission in 2010 and remains a tireless volunteer. And Bill, if you could, there you are. Okay, <laughs> so Bill Elio started as an intern in 1973, worked as an analyst in the Santa Cruz office for eight years and became our legislative liaison for five years and finished his work with the commission running the non the nonpoint pollution program into the 1990s. And he worked as a city planner and state director of the Sierra Club California, and is currently the California Director of Government Affairs for the Environmental Working Group. And finally, Linda, who is still with us, yay! So Linda Lachlan is the commission's uh, public access manager 
and she works out of the Santa Cruz office, as many of you know, um, and needs very little introduction. Um, but you may not know that uh, she is now the longest serving Coastal Commission staffer, having joined as a graduate student intern in 1977, shortly after the passage of the Coastal Act. So a very warm welcome to you all, and thank you for taking the time to talk with us today. Um, so we have, the way we're going to do this is we have a, a handful of questions that we are hoping to ask our panelists to start with. And, you know, as we're talking, if you all um, listening have, you know, some questions, please type them into the chat. And at the end, um, Sarah will, you know, read some of the questions in the time remaining. Um, we have everyone here with us. Uh, we originally slated this for 60 minutes, but some of our panelists um, have uh, generously agreed to stay um, 90 minutes in case we have a lot of questions. Um, so to get started, um, Susan, if you can kind of set the stage for us and just take us back in a time capsule to what was happening in the 1960s and what led up to the decision to run a ballot initiative in 1972, that would be fantastic. Well, I'm going to give you a little truncated history. Um, I was in high school in the 60s and in college in the 70s and uh, lived and breathed all these experiences. Um, and I actually have almost uh, 47 years with the commission, starting as a volunteer and uh, non-paid volunteer in, uh, in um, 1973. So I think the important thing when I was looking at the facts and kind of pulling this together is looking at the world and how population centers focus along the coast. And California was no different. And that's sort of an important backdrop to what happened in California. And after World War II, in the, in the time from 1945 to 1968, California's population went from 9.5 million to 19 million. We, now in 2022, we're at 39 million. But that, that period of right after World War II, there was huge amounts of development. And the coast was getting walled off places, Malibu, other places, subdivisions everywhere. Those of you who were alive at uh, those, in those days and could and ever drove by Malibu, I mean, it went from you could see the coast to you can't see the coast. Um, so that was just massive development. Also huge amounts of, of infrastructure, industrial development along the coast. And things, and one of the things I think is really important is remembering really San Francisco Bay was the beginning of the coastal program. So in the early 60s, um, there, was a, there was so much fill in San Francisco Bay that the Army Corps of Engineers predicted it was gonna end up being a river, the size of a river. And so in the early 60s in 1961, and I wanna emphasize this, three women started, um, the Save San Francisco Bay uh, Coalition and really worked hard to get that moving and working with the uh, legislative members. And in 1965, the McIntyre Petrus Act was the beginning of BCDC. Um, and it was set up in a way that was an interim agency and had to come up with a plan and go back. And just to keep that succinct, that's what happened. It went back to the legislature and legislature extended and change the law a little bit, but made it a permanent law. That's important because the Coastal Commission was really fashioned and all the legislation to do with the Coastal Commission was fashioned after um, the BCDC experiment. And that was a really, really, really critical thing that happened. Um, and then in 19, in early, you know, before that even in 1962, PG&E had pushed a whole a nuclear power plant in Bodega Head and that really got a lots of activism going in Northern California. Um, uh, the San Andreas Fault was found to run through there. And so luckily that, that uh, project was abandoned, but there was moved, that power plant ended up moving to another coastal location in San Luis Obispo County. So that was a critical, got everybody worried and concerned about nuclear power along the California coast. In 1968, um, the Sea Ranch development went in and closed off 10 miles of Sonoma Coast. 
to public access that had been used by the public for years. That, according to, uh, that was sort of the impetus to go for the legislature to start really getting interested in what was going um, along the coast because citizens were pissed about not being able to get to the beach. Um, and that really got Alan Cerrote, who you'll hear more about Alan Cerrote later, but Alan Cerrote, John uh, Dunlap, and um, I think Ed Zeberg was the third person, started getting going in coastal legislation. And I'm not going to go into all the details about the coastal legislation, but that was an important because Alan Cerrote was later the person that hired Peter Douglas, which started all sorts of things. So Alan um, was, a, was a critical member. Um, in 1968, then, the federal government sold offshore leases off California for oil and gas. And that really pushed, and there had been oil and gas development before, back to the 1800s, um, 1880, 1890, like really near shore. But the big offshore development really started with the the federal government le issuing those leases in 1968. Um, in 1969 was the big Santa Barbara oil spill. There was an explosion of natural gas and, and Unical Platform A exploded. And that 1969 oil spill, for all of us who were alive then, I was in high school then, um, it, was, it was devastating. And when you go back and look at the pictures and see what happened, there had never been an oil spill like that in the United States. So it wasn't, it wasn't just the effect on Californians, it was effect worldwide that really, I think, spurred a lot of people's um, focus and attention. Um, then um, in 1971 is when Peter Douglas was out of, out of uh, law school, had done some traveling and had his first uh, job in Sacramento with Alan Cerrote and his first assignment was <coughs> writing coastal act legislation. The long and short of it is several different things were tried, many things failed. They, there were several times the Senate couldn't get it through. Um, and there was the, a group called the Coastal Alliance that was getting things going um, for thinking it might have to go to an initiative. In 1972, the last sort of try that happened with um, getting coastal legislation through failed. And I'm gonna uh, hand it over to Warner in a moment because he was really, really, really active in working with the Coastal Alliance and getting the initiative. Um, one of the things that's important is the initiative was written really uh, a succinct form of the legislation that had not made it through the legislature. But some of the compromises that were in those were dropped out. And um, I'm not gonna take the time to do it today, but in pre preparing for this talk, I went back and reread Prop 20. And the, it, the preamble is a beautiful, it's just inspirational. And it reminded me of why um, I got charged up. And I think uh, all you. of you, might want to read that. And Linda has the uh, Proposition 20 uh, banner. Oh, and... Linda, show them your shirt too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Susan, for that. that and I'm going to hand it over to Warner you. to. Uh, yeah, so Warner, in. yeah, if you could kind of just talk about you know, what that was like. I mean, how do you, you know, for if you could sort of talk about working on Prop 20 and what you were doing at the time and, you know, how you got involved, I think that would be just fantastic to hear. I mean, you were in college at the time, right? Oh, Werner, you need to unmute. There, is that okay? Yeah, I was like, wow, okay. that's really quiet for Werner. Very good, sorry. <laughs> Unusual, Warner, silent. Um, I, I like to refer to the early 70s as like when dinosaurs roamed the earth and men's fashion was at lowest point in human history. Um, but it was also a very exciting time. You kind of you got to keep in mind, you evolved out of the 60s where you had the civil rights movement, the women's movement, the environment, the peace movement. Um, and all of those things were, were happening. And in, 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 as uh, uh, 
as, as it has been, been stated, um, you know, 1969 was not only the Santa Barbara oil spill, but the day that I, the very, I, I went back, I was looking at dates, the very day I graduated high school in June 1969 was the day that the Cuyahoga River caught fire. Um, and I noticed in a reading for the 12th time in over a 20 year period, but this was the first time it kind of got the public's uh, attention. You had in 1970, you had Earth Day. In 1971, Edward Abbey uh, released a book called Desert Solitaire that was a very good treatise to think about uh, nature and our, our role in it. Uh, June of 72 was also when Richard Nixon was uh, uh, had his group of invading the, the, the Watergate. Uh, July of 72 was when Ms. Magazine first came out for its, its, its first issue. Um, October of 72, Congress uh, passed the, 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 the Clean Water Act. Um, this was a very activist period in, in, in California. Um, I had gone off to college. I was going to be the next Frank Lloyd Wright. I went to Cal Poly to be an architecture student. One of the first books that, that I read was uh, Designed with Nature by Ian McCarg. And I realized that I was a lot more interested in land use planning than I was in, in, in architecture. A young biology student started an ecology action club in, in college and in San Luis Obispo. Um, we were concerned about them developing uh, the farmlands around um, uh, the San Luis Obispo. And we, on a lark, we ran our little 30 person ecology action club, ran a student for the city council on an environmental platform. And by God, we got them elected. We got political power hungry and we ran a biology professor and a city and regional planning grad student for the board of supervisors and our little gang of 30 kids um, got them both elected to the board of supervisors. So I realized that I, I was a lot more interested in land use, and I so I, I applied to UC Santa Cruz that was starting a new program um, that, that Susan and I ended up, both ended up at the, this environmental planning program. But I had a year in between, so I, I was very involved in coastal, getting interested in coastal issues, and I got hired by the Alliance to drive the coast and kind of temporarily live out of my VW van. I had about a $40,000 budget to drive the coast and offer $5,000 grants in counties to set up uh, storefront ecology centers and to try to also identify people in each county that could help gather the signatures that were needed to uh, put the initiative on the ballot. We got it on the ballot. And then one of the first things we did was we did a bike ride from a, a very conservative, kind of modest gentleman from uh, a legislator from San Diego said, let's do a bike ride down the coast. and we did a bike ride from San Francisco to San Diego. With we picked up celebrities along the way, and I drove ahead in the VW van, stapling arrows on on telephone poles to keep people going. And and I'd show up at, at radio stations to sort of be advance man, so that we'd have a celebrity and a politician in each radio station down the coast to kind of generate public interest for the the campaign. About halfway down, I I met a young woman that was the several years older than me that was the communications person for the campaign. I promptly fell in love with her and moved into Los Angeles to work out of the campaign headquarters in Los Angeles. Los Angeles was sort of the, the because being the, the biggest media market in the state was, was sort of like the headquarters of the campaign. And um, you know we, we had very little money. So as the volunteer coordinator, I basically went around to high schools and college campuses saying, they've got the money, we've got the issues, join us we need we need bodies so very quickly because of of the movement that had occurred over the 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 kind of the previous years we suddenly had literally hundreds of volunteers in in uh the campaign now the opposition campaign was run by a firm called Whitaker and Baxter they were kind of like the Darth Vader death star of campaign politics there's a new yorker story called the google new yorker lie factory and it talks about the origins of Whitaker and Baxter and kind of the beginning of political campaign management. And on issues like, like initiatives and citizen initiatives, they had a very simple sort of sledgehammer uh, strategy, which was take the, the opponent's slogan, steal it, outspend them 10, 10 to one, and just tell people to vote the opposite way. So in the last month of the campaign, suddenly across Los Angeles, about 500 billboards erupted up, not the giant billboards, but like the 20 by 20 foot billboards selling cool cigarettes on you know, the sides of liquor stores and stuff that were within reach, important point, within reach 
Um, and these billboards, and they all said they were navy blue background, day glow orange lettering that said, the beach belongs to you, don't lock it up. That's how, kind of our slogan, because public access to the coast was like almost one of the major prime motivators. And so this slogan, the beach belongs to you, don't lock it up, vote no on Proposition 20. And I had literally hundreds of volunteers that were outraged and they wanted to burn the billboards down and stuff. We thought, wait a minute, they got our slogan. Let's just improve their, their billboard. So we went down to Hermosa Beach, got an unemployed silk screener, and we printed 500 day glow orange yeses, exact the same block lettering on navy blue background. And what do kids do in Los Angeles? They got cars, they cruise. So we drew, taking my architecture and emerging land use planning expertise, brilliant expertise, we drew a grid for Los Angeles and we each kid went out on one night and mapped where the billboards were in, in one particular multi-block area. We met in a parking lot one night. We handed out the um, yeses and the kids and, and we, we said, let's do this only one night. We're not going to do it the second night because they'll have guards and be ready to arrest you the second night. So you, you only got one night. They stole our slogan. We will borrow their billboards. So we fanned out one night and we altered. I don't know how many. Uh, my memory is probably going to in, inflate it, but we got at least half, if not more, of the 500 billboards. The next day, Clem Whitaker was driving to his office in Los Angeles. He almost hit a nun at an intersection because he was looking around at a billboard. He was he walked into his office and he was just spitting kneel, nails. He was so angry. <laughs> when he walks into his office, one of his employees was rifling his filing cabinet, trying to get the map of the billboards because he had been converted and wanted to give them to me, not knowing that we already had done our own map and had already altered the billboards. So the, his poor employee broke down, confessed and crying. And so they, they but it gets even better because the, the next day, the Los Angeles Times ran a story on the front page of the B section. And if you read the LA Times, and you're from LA, you take the A section, which is national news, you put it aside, and you start reading the B section. So here was a story in the LA Times going out to several million people about the altered billboards. But by this time, the employee had confessed and they were accused. So they figured, well, we'll arrest Warner. And because he, you know, they, they hadn't my name, but when they went to court, the, the, our legal counsel, who later became the, the city attorney, said, wait a minute, you're accusing this Warner Chabot for altering billboards, and who's your only witness? It's an employee of Whitaker and Baxter, so that, that case got, got thrown out. The better part, too, was that this was a, a campaign in which there were a lot of, this was the farm worker initiative, and there were a variety of initiatives on the ballot, um, and the billboard companies were basically overloaded and it would take them like 30 days to alt to get out and fix the billboards. So our bi altered billboards, we got the free publicity in the LA Times and our altered billboards stayed up for most of the campaign. We won the campaign. Um, I, I remember, I think we, we got, we got back then, remember the early 60s, Charleston Heston, you know, rolled up his pants legs and did cut a free commercial for us. And he was also a big Nixon follower. And I just remember on, on campaign victory night, instead of going to the Nixon headquarters, Charlton Hudson showed up with a couple of bottles of jug wine. We, we celebrated our victory, but it was, it was a, a classic thing of a lot of citizenry organizing and standing up and saying, this is wrong. This is right. Here's what we're going to do about it. And it was just, it was just one example of kind of citizen activism that did great things. I'll stop there. Thank you, Warren. I love that story. That's one of my all-time favorite stories. Um, okay, so so you brought us up to, to how this happened. Prop 20 has passed, and suddenly, overnight, you have to create an agency. Um, so how did you do that? I mean, did you even have an office? You know, what was it like to work for a brand new agency? You know, what was the culture like in those early days? Um, when the commission was first starting up. I don't know. I mean, Bill, do you want to take a crack? I'll at take the first crack. First, Sorry. on 1972, I turned 21 that year, so I was able to vote. And I look back at that election on that uh, November uh, 72 ballot was legalizing marijuana for the first time. It failed. Raise, <laughs> lowering the voting age from 21 to 18, it passed. Nixon versus Reagan, uh, excuse me, Nixon versus George McGovern, and then Prop 20. It was a really intriguing uh, election for me as a 21-year-old. Um, 
I was at UC Santa Cruz the year before Warner and, and Susie, and um, my professor my senior year was Bert Muley, who was a teacher, a lecturer at Santa Cruz, and a professor of city planning over in San Jose State. And he said to me, there's this new Coastal Commission down there. This was like Jan February of my, the winter quarter. And he said, you should get down there and be an intern. I said, what? He said, get down there and be an intern. Eddie Brown, my former senior planner, because he had been planning director of the Santa Cruz County, just tell him Bert sent you. So I went down there with another guy named Les Sternad, who was also a senior at UC Santa Cruz. We became the first interns at the Coastal Commission. That was March of 20, uh, 1973. So the, the, it was amazing how fast the offices ramped up because the law just passed in November and the offices opened by February 1st and they started regional coastal commission hearings right after that. So the people I saw as interns were borrowed from the county. People, some were planners, some weren't. Some ended up staying for a long, long time like Lee Otter and uh, Diane Landry. Uh, one was borrowed, a master, guy had a master's in planning from Harvard, I think, Andy Schiffman, who went back to work for the county of Santa Cruz. And then we started hiring permanent staff later that year. Um, so it was amazing how fast it was thrown together and became an efficient machine. And one thing I saw that year was that cemented my career for me was the commission heard from, uh, I think it was that, it could have been the next year, the city of Santa Cruz approved a convention center, an eight-story Hilton Inn and a bunch of condominiums on Lighthouse Point in Santa Cruz. And it was a joint development between TMI, Teachers Management Investment, and the city. And this was, I don't know how many acres it is, but it's an iconic point of land in California. And the hearing was, we knew it was big. They held it in Civic Auditorium and there were 3,000 people and they were stomping their feet on the bleachers. It was had, a, you know, stands. And the hearing was raucous. It went on for hours. And I sat through this whole thing in the stands watching and I wasn't down on the staff. The staff was presenting their staff report and it was fun. I go, I want to do this. The commission voted it down like 14 to two and state parks eventually bought that land from TMI and it's still an open space now. Some say a large dog park, but at one point they were going to build a campground there, but it's another story. But the, the, the flavor of that whole thing, the energy the way the commission acted, the way they stood up to the local government was amazing. And this was all in those early months and was super exciting to see. I'll stop there. If, if I can add a, a couple of things, Nawaki, to what Bill had to say, and this goes back to the BCDC structure that what happened was the new executive director of the Coastal Commission was Joe Botovitz, who had been the executive director at BCDC. So he knew what he was doing. And Mel Lane, who was originally appointed as the chairman of the of BCDC by Pat Brown, Governor Pat Brown, was then uh, made the chair of the state commission um, by uh, Ronald Reagan, Governor Reagan at the time. And those two people had a really, they had the, experience and the ability to step in and do something quickly. And um, Jill Botovitz is still alive, uh, a fabulous human being. And Mel Lane was an amazing um, leader and guidance on the state commission that really pulled to together some really controversial actions um, and, and, and got everything going and got a budget and hired staff and moved fast and that made an enormous difference so great thanks we should say right there in case people don't know there were regional commissions in the north coast north central central coast san diego south central and la so all these regional commissions with 16 commissioners were appointed and put into place almost immediately and started hearing so that was a huge deal and then the state commission was for appeals and i'm not sure if they had original jurisdiction over the Tidelands, I think they did, even from the start, but I, I didn't read the act again to, to be sure. Yeah, thanks for um, explaining that, Bill. I think sometimes we forget to, you know, <laughs> to to explain these things for, for folks that are hearing it for the first time. Um, so, so one of the features of Prop 20 is that, you know, was that it was only going to be good for four years. Um, so, you know, during that time, the commission had to complete a statewide plan for long-term coastal protection for the legislature to make it permanent through legislation, which was a monumental 
task. Um, and Lee, I, I know that you worked really extensively on that. Um, could you, I guess, talk about that a little bit? And sure. Lee, also feel free to share any observations or memories you have about those early days too. Well, how, how can I top Warner's uh, <laughs> account here? The uh, uh, I was an activist in, back in the 1960s, and uh, so that kind of influenced uh, my career choice. Um, but I thought in those days that the only way you were going to save the coast uh, was to buy it. And, and that's why uh, uh, that's one of the reasons I... Uh, made a career out of the uh, National Park Service eventually and, uh, you know, went to places like Point Reyes National Seashore and Olympic National Park. And thanks to the Monterey County uh, Draft Board and one of the movements was uh, uh, anti-Vietnam, I, I got a non-combatant assignment as a Navy uh, research officer, oceanographic research officer at uh, the old naval facility at Point Sur. Well, you know, that just uh, you know, further cemented my determination that somebody's got to do something to save the Big Sur coast. And that's part of the whole coast of California. I sure didn't like what the uh, Monterey County had in mind. We had a land use plan in those days that would have uh, divided up all the land in Big Sur into little one and five acre parcels, which might sound kind of large, but it would mean a population of tens of thousands of people and um, you'd have to widen Highway 1 to four lanes and all of that. Well, so um, while I was uh, at Point Sur, I met a fellow named uh, uh, Sam Farr, uh, who'd been in high school with me, and also uh, another fellow, Peter Douglas. Uh, and they, uh, <laughs> they, uh, they said, well, you know, we're, we're trying to get this proposition through and we need people to circulate petitions. So while I was still in the Navy, I was an activist on my off hours and <laughs> circulating a, a petition. And I remember standing in front of the Safeway store uh, asking people if they're registered to vote in California and things like that. Um, I, I did manage to get all the sailors on the base who were uh, California citizens to sign up, but they, they weren't that many. So that's why I had to go into Safeway. Well, Proposition 20, um, you know, quite a campaign. It did pass, and it came time for me to go back to the National Park Service. So I was uh, a district ranger at Channel Islands, and uh, under the, uh, I heard about the Intergovernmental Personnel Act, and this would give me a chance to uh, work for this uh, newfangled uh, Coastal Commission thing. So by the end of 1973, uh, here I was at the Santa Cruz uh, office, uh, you know, Central Coast Regional Commission, and I got assigned my first, uh, you know, major permit. I don't know if you can see this. This is a report done for coastal permit number uh, 109, which means it was the uh, yeah, <laughs> very very early in the in the process. And it was about a, a seven mile long stretch of. Uh, relocating uh, Highway 1 and turning it into a freeway uh, coming out of Monterey Peninsula. And so uh, got to cut my teeth on that. Um, and that was a, uh, it worked with Caltrans on that and then later uh, to extend that four more miles into Fort Ord. And uh, so there, you know, uh, coastal dunes, uh, environmentally sensitive habitat areas, coastal access and the like were all major issues. Uh, one of the uh, conditions we placed on our permit, which was approved by our commissioners, was that they not build the frontage road between the highway and the ocean, uh, which would have provided access to something like 13 parcels of land, uh, which were coveted by hotel developers. They wanted to build high-rise hotels all on the shore of Monterey Bay. And since we said, no, you can't do that to Caltrans, they had to find some alternative <laughs> and, and uh, you know, in order to avoid the takings provisions. Um, and so the, uh, uh, that was done. Eventually we did wind up with um, Marina state beach and that's how, uh, uh, you know, the takings issue was uh, addressed. Um, it represents one of the various compromises were necessary in order to get through good planning in those days. And there were plenty of defeats and victories and often involving the very same legislators. Uh, uh, Senator Mello, in this case, made it possible for there to be a Marina State Beach, but he uh, also 
carved out little exceptions within the coastal zone where you could uh, develop uh, without a coastal permit, like what became the embassy suite site and seaside. So that's how things were in the first year, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lee. Um, all right, so. And wait, before we yeah. move on, Nowaki, yeah. can you talk a little bit about the, the plan? Um, let, um, Yes, Lee, right. about the, the California Coastal Plan and why it was so important that that the commission get that finished in four years. Sure, it's important to get it finished in four years because there was uh, the original Proposition Twenty, and I'll call it uh, Coastal Act for short. Uh, it expired in four years. There, it was a great possibility there wouldn't be any regulation of development on the coast other than through the uh, local governments. And so uh, the purpose, the whole purpose of the uh, Prop 20 was to uh, you know, regulate development, basically put the brakes on the worst of it. And uh, you know, for that four years to give time to develop the plan. And the plan is made up uh, a lot of uh, what I think are quite far-sighted policies, which have since influenced uh, what's gone into all these local coastal programs. And there were a lot of contributors to it. Um, you know, I remember doing a couple of pages on, for example, uh, on Big Sur Coast. So that's the, um, so it was uh, put together in that way, but beautifully edited and put together. And it, I think it's still used as a, an important reference work. Let me, let me add to that. It, um, it's full of, it was trying to, it was doing regional planning for the first time too. This was greater than local concern and it had not been done before. So regional planning, when I applied to grad school, that's why I went to get a master's in regional planning because this is the way I thought it should, should look from my early experience with the Coastal Commission and nothing against you MCP or MUP people, city or urban planners, but that's what I thought it should be regional. And that's what the plans were about. I got hired as an intern, a paid intern in 74 to work on the plan with Susan. We were side by side working on various elements. I worked on the geology aspect of that. And this is where a state agency looking at things that had never been looked at before in a land use perspective. And that's what Warner said. It was about land use, but is this quarry going to do what? Will it impact that? I also, as an intern in San Diego, worked on the definition of bodies of water and wetlands because that was critical in Prop 20 and then eventually in determining what the eventual coastal zone boundary would look like. And people had to decide, well, where's the tidal influence and where should the lines go? So that was a lot of fun for me to look at estuaries down in San Diego County uh, one by one. I think there's 13 lagoons along that county and, and writing up stuff and handing that to the staff. Then I went back up to Santa Cruz, um, but uh, that was- uh, And no really computers back then, right? Oh, no, no. Everything we did was handwritten, <laughs> handwritten and typed on an IBM Selectric and then used correcting tape. And then we would get for our staff reports, these long yellow uh, legal things. We'd cut and paste with scotch tape, That's handwritten right. editions, <laughs> send it back to the person who would type us for it, bring it back to us. We'd write more on it. They'd retype it. This went back and forth for a few days, scrambling to get a packet together for the commission. Yep. And we're we're back then. I mean, were the reports as long as they are now? Oh no, <laughs> oh, no, they couldn't be. Uh, okay. They they were much more succinct and yeah. but um, and we we didn't have any xeroxing machines or collating machines. We used to walk around the table and collate things. Yeah. <laughs> and in in the Santa Cruz office, we had commit the, the the regional commission had meetings every week. So we would like pull these staff reports together and deliver them to commissioners on Houses. Friday or Saturday, drive all over. I know Lee drove Monterey, I drove San Mateo. I mean, we took turns going places. It was really hectic, really wow. hectic. Thank you. Um, fascinating, but hectic. Yep. Um, and just a reminder to everyone, um, you know, if you have questions um, that come up along the way, you know, feel free to just type them in the chat and we'll, you know, go through them towards the end. Um, so hey, okay, let me yeah. let me jump back to Prop oh, sure. 22, uh, Prop 20 and I just sent you for one second. The one thing that allowed this to pass was there was what we called a wart in almost every city and county that had been approved by a local government because of developer pressure. And I'm mean, even in, in good places like Santa Cruz 
had their dream in, you know, right on the beach, right over the beach in San Diego condos on Pacific Beach that shaded the beach in the morning. The Monterey Bay Hotel in, mm -hmm. in Monterey, right next to San City, a marina, no, San City, that when you drove on Highway 1, you couldn't see the ocean for, for like 20 seconds. And that really passed it. Bert Muley, my advisor professor at Santa Cruz, had a slideshow that he went up and down the coast showing that he had examples in his slideshow from Arcata all the way down to the Tijuana border of what was done poorly by local government. That was the big push is that you need to have a, a broader authority, which was super controversial. And while I can say now we had public hearings on the coastal plan and at a public hearing, I believe it was in Moss Landing, the, some commissioners were there to take public input on the plan and hear from them about how this local state partnership should work. Someone brought in a donkey into the hearing room and put on its butt coastal commissioner like you are an ASS. And that was written up in the paper. Everyone thought that was pretty funny, but commissioners were sometimes, in, they would try to intimidate them because people were not accepting this new form of bureaucracy and control with just without rolling, you know, they didn't want to roll over. There was a big fight over everything. It was like the proposition passed, let's create the new law and get this thing going. It was controversial from the start. I'd just like to add one point that I, I'd say, from 1972 to 1980, sort of the environmental movement picked up so much steam and because of the coastal initiative in 72, and then later the passage of the, uh, the coastal act in 76, you had from every city, county across the state, campaigns for people running for city council or board of supervisors, um, entities that ultimately were involved with the legislature in appointing people to be on the commission, you had sort of a, a really a landmark shift in public values. People recognized that the coast was fragile, that they weren't going to make any more of it. And each one of these losses, uh, where there were losses, became fodder for campaigns to replace elected officials and put more conservation-minded, more visionary, ecologically-minded uh, people elected to office. And what, what your position was on land use and environmental issues became a cornerstone of people then running for office at the city, county, and state legislative level. Thank you so much. Um, this is all so fascinating to, to listen to. Um, it's amazing how some things have changed and some things are, are very much the same. Um, I think one of the things that is probably still very much the same is that you know we're always kind of um, having to navigate these really sort of tricky political waters. And if you could kind of talk about you know what that was like in the early days, um, you know Brian and Bill, you you both um, served as late legislative liaisons, or sorry, just Bill, uh, you, you served as a legislative liaison for part of your time at the commission. And you know what were some of the controversial issues back then, um, and and how did you? you know, handle them. And and obviously, you know, Linda, Lee and, and Warner and Susan, if you want to chime in on that too, that'd be great. Well, I was, I was the commission's lobbyist in the, in the 85 to 90. So obviously way after Prop 20 and that initial interim permit controls, what it was called interim. But I know I'm, I have a friend here in Sacramento who lobbied for the League of Cities. I and mean, I met him in 85 and he was involved in negotiations on the Coastal Act of 76 fighting for the cities and so he he filled me in on a lot of stuff but that was the biggie that was number one it was affordable housing was very controversial but it slipped into the coastal act but the play between local and regional and statewide control was the biggest issue by far and of course we we're going to protect wetlands and stuff but another huge one was the coastal boundary and that was you know what we were working on in the coastal plan is where should it be and it's you know now commission staff working, it goes miles inland in some places and Big Sur up to that first visible ridge, uh, seven miles around uh, inland around Elkhorn Slough in, Mo in Monterey County. But we were working a lot on where should it go in that coastal plan and legislatively that boundary was messed with a lot. And as soon as it was, as it was adopted in the Coastal Act and described in 76, bills were introduced to adjust it. And there were some big losses from those little boundary adjustments. I know in uh, Marina, a hotel was built because the Senator then Henry Mello was in with the developers and got a cut around that uh, wetland and that we thought should be inland, you know, another thousand feet or something. And 
it allowed a hotel development, which was done by a union. And politically, that's some of the play. I'm still, I'm a lobbyist now for the Environmental Working Group. The union Enviro play, it's still going on. And there were union people who wanted things. Another union hotel at Half Moon Bay was controversial for years. Um, and that's kind of how it thinks. So the coastal boundary was fought over in Sacramento many, many times. And Peter Douglas spent a lot of time on that. Peter was the first uh, lobbyist for the commission. Once he was hired by the commission, he was in Sacramento already. So he was their lobbyist. Um, he eventually hired a man named Bill Yates, who's still an attorney here in Sacramento. And uh, Bill would visit the regional offices and give us an, a little rundown of what's happening in Sacramento because we were busy doing permits and working on the, the coastal plan and later the LCPs. And Bill Yates would come and say, this is what it's like. This is what you do has an impact on what I can do. And he never said, and Peter never said, be careful, we, we can't do that because Senator so-and-so will be mad. That was one of Peter's great strengths is that he was willing to go toe to toe politically and fight these battles out. So I, as a lobbyist, Sarah now had the backing of management. And this goes all the way back into the early seventies of how this thing was played out backed by public support of the initiative in, immediately and at the hearings and that went on and on. And that great video I watched yesterday, what's it called? Heroes, Heroes of, the of the Coast. Heroes of the Coast. That was one of the big emphasis in that movie was we could have done what we did without the public being all over this and the Coastal Act, the brilliance of it and Prop 20 was allowing so much uh, public participation. You know, I think that controversy comment is a great segue, Bill, um, for Susan to... Uh, I'd, I'd love, Susan, for you to share the story of how the San Onofre nuclear power plant got built in the first place, and then what was accomplished in the wake of that um, uh, of that project in terms of what the commission did uh, after it was built, if you don't mind. So Southern California Edison applied uh, to the Coastal Commission to under Prop 20. This was under the Prop 20 to apply for um, units two and three of, of San Onofre. And the long story short is the commission initially denied that permit, um, mostly based on marine resource impacts. There was a, one of the state commissioners was Rimmon C. Fay, who was a, um, a very interesting biologist. And um, one of the things that he did, he was, he collected organisms and things like that for studies in colleges and he's he's a brilliant guy uh, um, and also a very eccentric person but he had a big impact on that particular getting that denied and so that denial stood for a little bit but then there was all sorts of and I don't know all the details but I did hear stories from Peter um, and he was in the legislature at the time and was essentially told by members of the legislature and staff and all sorts of other people that if you don't get that nuclear power plant approved, then there's just kiss off having a coastal commission after um, Prop 20 sunsets. So I'm not sure all the details, but he worked with um, the commission staff, uh, Joe Bodovitz and others, uh, to go back to the commission that it, the application went back to the commission. The commission approved the nuclear power plant, but with really massive conditions. Um, one for a, some access ways for um, a campground there and a, a whole bunch of geologic things. But the, the biggest component was to set up the independent marine review committee that had um, um, a member of the environmental community, Southern California Edison, and a, the three scientists, and a scientist recommended or uh, appointed by the commission. And the Marine Review Committee had to do this independent analysis and do all this studying and then recommend mitigation after the fact, after, and it was based on the impacts that, that they found from unit one projected into the impacts that were expected for units two and three. Um, and um, I worked on that following that program, the Marine Review Committee for many years as a staff person. And then when they were done, the 
we took the recommendations and we went back to the commission um, and there's a massive mitigation program that's still underway and Kate and the energy staff and Allison worked on that we, many of us have still still people are still involved in it which involved um, building a, a, art, a very very large uh, artificial reef to, to restore kelp and a wetland restoration project the important things that came out of that though specifically were incredible data on once through cooling which then has led the the um the um, resources the water quality the regional water quality control boards and the state water resources control board to put new standards and essentially ban new um once through cooling and so that data and the, re the independent science that the commission required was just groundbreaking and the work that the coastal commission has done ongoing to make sure that the conditions were implemented and there were performance standards that they had to meet to show that the mitigation actually worked and we've actually gone back and made edison do more and more add to the reef do different mitigation at the the wetlands um so that was a a pretty significant um uh step and even though yes the power plant was built but uh and sometimes those compromises and i think what peter and others saw at that time is is sometimes you have to go forward with some development that you may not want but how can you do it in the best way possible to get a greater good um so that that's sort of the summary of that are there any other things i should you want me to add to that sarah yeah, thanks, Susan. That's perfect. I just wanted to add that's also how we got um, San Onofre State Park, which then turned out to be a linchpin in our argument for the denial of the toll road at Trestles. So I just I really love the San Onofre story because it really illustrates how something that is feels very, very unpleasant and feels like a loss at the time can over time, you, you just never know where history is going to go, is, is the point. The, the, the takeaway from San Onofre is what I think. Yeah, it's like crisis is danger and opportunity. And in every crisis uh, that we're working with, we always tried to figure out how to push the opportunity as much as possible. Um, Sarah, I'd, I'd like to do an, sort of a kind of an anecdote that builds on the San Onofre issue. And it sort of ties in with the issue of, of politics, money, and citizen activism um, the, the, the ties into this. That that uh, I always like to say that by the time you become governor of California, you have had to attend maybe 500 backyard cocktail parties with people that can write one to five thousand dollar checks. People who can write one to five thousand dollar checks usually have a vacation home or a financial interest in some piece of property along the coast. So by the time you get to become governor of California or a state senator or an assembly person, you've probably heard 250 horror stories about the bureaucratic thugs at the Coastal Commission for every story you've heard about. Thank God the Coastal Commission pr provided, saved this or provided public access to the coast. So there's still, in, you know, the coast is always sort of like the Benghazi, Beirut, Baghdad of land use politics. There's more environmental sensitivity. There's more laws. There's more lawyers. There's more special interest involved. It's a highly politicized and will always be a highly politicized effort. But when when Peter, when the, the San Onofre nuclear power plant was approved, one of the conditions was that they invest multi-million dollars in kind of building and restoring the offshore natural reef out out there um and in the 25 years after the passage of prop 20 in the mid 90s um the governor of california uh under significant pressure one from uh the the owners of san onofre who didn't want to um actually pay out what they had committed to pay out along with a developer who wanted to build a uh subdivision in the bolsa chica wetlands in orange county persuaded the the governor to fire Peter Douglas for, I think this was probably the fifth or sixth attempt to, to fire him. And we, several of us got a, literally the Coastal Commission agenda on Friday for the following Friday was agenda item number five, review of the performance of the executive director of the Coastal Commission. Agenda item six, 
uh, appointment of interim director of the California Coastal Commission. And a, a, when this kind of surfaced in back in hippie Santa Cruz County, a, a, a local underground paper did a political cartoon that was a deck of a pirate ship showing developers, you know, showing Peter Douglas walking the plank on the pirate ship while developers were breaking into a safe that had the California coast on it. And we knew that there was going to be Friday was the day that Peter Douglas was going to be fired in Orange County, which is kind of a media desert. It, 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 there's, no, there's no really big TV stations there. So we decided, well, the, the theme of, well, don't pirate the coast. So we, we sent somebody down to buy $100 worth of uh, pirate regalia. We figured we'll do a pirate rally, don't pirate the coast the day before at the Coastal Commission meeting so that we get a story in the LA Times that runs uh, the morning of that might help turn out people in Orange County. We also knew we needed to get TV cameras there. So we called the Hollywood Women's Political Caucus and said, get us a celebrity so we can hold a rally and we need, we need a celebrity so that film crews will come down from Los Angeles and up from San Diego. They got us one of the lifeguards from the TV show Baywatch to be the, the, the hostess of the, the rally. We, we convened a bunch of people we, we put kind of the rule was children and elderly women up front for the cameras, and they were all <laughs> decked out in pirate regalia. Um, the rally was very successful. The next day, the LA Times had a story that had two pictures in it, one an elderly woman with a pirate uh, eye patch with a skull and crossbones on it, and another sort of almost this uh, angelic, ethereal uh a picture of, of, of Peter looking out o o over the coast. Thousands of people, sh not, not thousands, I'd say hundreds of people showed up. We had gotten a, a whole series of editorials. We blew them up two foot by three foot. So when the commissioners walked in on the both sides of the hearing room were like about a dozen editorials blown up two foot by three foot on easels. And we turned the tables on the commission in the public. And a lot of the people who organized this were sort of elderly women that had been longtime activists throughout California. And we said, this isn't a review of the performance of Peter Douglas. Oh God, you got the picture of the pirate ship. Yeah. So excellent. Well done. So we turned it into, this is, this is a performance review of the Coastal Commission. Are you going to cave in to people that have a vested interest, a financial interest, or are you going to represent the people of California that want the coast protected? We turned it around. Peter Douglas' job was was secure for, and then it became sort of bulletproof for years afterwards. No one tried to fire him for I think you know another ten years because when they tried to fire him, the public turned out. They showed up and said, "Don't pirate the coast." Thanks, Warner. Just shows how important the public continues to be for the program. And just as a side note, Linda, you. You showed a T-shirt, and I think in the context of, uh, you know, political pressure and tension with the governor's office, can you explain that that shirt and where that came from? So it says, if you can't see it, coastal bureaucratic thugs. Put it down a little bit. Yeah. yeah. So uh, the year, oh, yeah, I might have to call on some of my other colleagues that started with me in 77 that are on the, on the Zoom with us, but they're... It, this issue comes up in Malibu. There had been a, a, a fire that had burned up in the mountains and came down to the coast and wiped out a number of houses along the coast, you know, beachfront homes. And the staff, I don't know, maybe Jack has something to add to this. I'm not sure if he was, oh, you weren't doing Malibu at that time. Um, but anyway, the staff said, well, you can rebuild your houses, but you're going to have to provide public access easements between the houses from PCH down to the beach. And um, you could imagine that was very unpopular, especially with this one property owner, uh, Linda Ronstad. And um, <laughs> so as soon as the staff said this was going to be the recommendation, out comes this you know, underground, um, well, I think the governor, no, I'm sorry, the governor called us coastal bureaucratic thugs for picking on these poor people, poor people, uh, these rich people that had lost their homes and that we were going to require public access from them. Wasn't Jerry Brown dating Linda Ronstadt yeah. at the time? Well, <laughs> actually he was. And Ronstadt didn't just want to, if she wanted to rebuild her house within 10% of the footprint, she needed no permit, no permit needed. She wanted to make a much bigger house. So the commission said, you need to get a coastal permit. And that's what set Brown off. 
And he said, they're a bunch of coastal bureaucratic thugs. A footnote on that is here in Sacramento, when he was still governor, he used to work out in the same gym I was at, he and Ann Gust, his wife. And I went up and chatted him up a couple of times. That's it. Look, I'm not going to lobby you anything. I just want to recall, do you remember the, 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 the thing in Malibu where he had, I still have the t-shirt that says coastal bureaucratic thugs. He goes, remember it. I'm the one who said it. <laughs> why, so why so he said yeah. this and then how soon after did somebody at the agency create these t-shirts oh and not, not very long it was it was, it was mark great Del builder it was mark <laughs> delaplane and on the t-shirt and hat it says in fine print not printed at state express and it's a closer bureaucratic thugs with the with the shirt and i have a baseball cap i still have and the t-shirt yeah. but jerry brown said remind me i'm a wonder he's still he's can be crabby but an interesting <laughs> but how, I mean, in all, you know, in all seriousness, um, you know, I think, I think for some of our younger staff, um, I mean, how do you, how do you, how did staff, how do you deal with these kinds of setbacks? Like, you know, how do you sort of grapple with this internally and sort of keep, keep going? Well, well one of them is you make t-shirts and you make you feel like, you know, we're all part of a team, right? And then we have a purpose. And I think it's always important to remember because every time we have a big hearing or we've done in more recent times, we've done surveys of the people of California, not just the coastal people um, that say the coast is so important to me. And it doesn't matter if I uh, you know, live in inland parts of California and if I only go to the coast once a year or maybe not even that. It's super important to them to know the coast is open and available to everybody. And that, I think, is one of the things that keeps us going. We know we're working for the people. We're not. It's, it's a law, but the people believe in it and they continue to show us they believe in it. And so we have a mission to accomplish, and we're reminded of that every day. And I think we also usually win loose battles, but we're winning the war. I think that keeps us going. And we hardly ever lost. We lost one big vested rice case because when the Coastal Act was going to pass, possibly, and then passed, people went out and started pouring foundations all over the coast using a, a city permit or partial building permit. So there were a bunch of lawsuits over that. And we won a bunch of those, but we lost one big one. We didn't lose another big case until Nolan versus Coastal Commission at Faria Beach on public access. And I was the lobbyist that year. We had beat or held off all these lawsuits year after year after year and barely ever lost. So we didn't have to take a lot of punch, uh, gut punches, to be honest. We usually were winning. And then Peter and the lobbyists would negotiate settlements. And I, again, I go back to San Onofre, like we kind of, or Bolsa Chica, San Onofre, we kind of lost, but as Warner said, no, no, in the big picture. And Sarah said, there were some victories in that. And because we always were looking at that big picture and putting great conditions on things, mitigation was a huge word, mitigation, mitigation. So we didn't feel like we're, uh, we lost another one. We hardly ever lost. And I, I, th I think if I might add that, the importance for me personally, and I think everybody in those early years was public service. We have the privilege and honor to be public servants and really, and a law that the Coastal Prop 20 and the Coastal Act of 76, incredible piece of legislation. And that all came from the work that the public did local and, you know, getting local governments to move into a more of a partnership still still not completely a partnership but that push to move that in the larger than local interests and i think when it's the teamwork really made a big a big difference of you know picking yourself back up looking at the law and doing the best that we can do on an everyday basis uh, and the passion and care for the coast that yeah and you know what what really matters here in the greater picture. So I'm I'm looking at the time and I kind of want to be mindful of folks that might have questions. Um, I still have a, a number of questions if you don't, but um, you know, if there's if there's a burning question that that folks would like to to a ask, um, um please I do have in several chat. in the uh in the chat, Noaki, but I, I know the one question you have left, which is what is the one thing you'd like to impart? I think that's a pretty important question. So why don't we do that? And then we'll move through some of the questions in the chat. Okay, Sarah, do you want to ask that question since you pretty much asked it? <laughs> since I just <laughs> asked it? Uh, sure, just briefly, again, mindful of the time because we really do want to get to the um, the Q&A. But uh, 
if you could in in 60 seconds or less if you could import impart one thing to the new staff particularly the very very many capable wonderful talented staff who weren't even born in 1972 or 96 if you could impart one thing to them about what you've learned at the coastal commission this would be a great opportunity to do do so and we'll start with you warner i think recognizing that you're carrying on a legacy of some very visionary uh, people that would go back, you know, 50 years that had worked very, very hard uh, from citizen activists to professionals to uh, locally elected officials to journalists who wrote great stories about it, that you're continuing a, a legacy that uh, um, is supported extremely broad across all socioeconomic sectors. Every poll that's been done shows that African American and Latino voters, you know, poll much higher on coastal commission than 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 even white voters. So you are carrying on a, a legacy um and protecting something that is a a treasure for all Californians, um, especially those that can't afford to own a piece of the coast, that the coast does belong to everybody. That's fantastic, Warner, the arc of history. Susan, 60 seconds or less, burning burning advice to impart. Bring your curiosity and passion and caring um, and public service. And knowing that the California coast is just an exceptionally special place on the face of the earth. And you get the privilege to um, work to protect it. Lovely. Susan. Bill? Yeah, I think being grateful for being on staff because the training you get while you're on staff is incredible because the word holistic arose in the late 60s, early 70s with the environmental movement. And that's what I learned as a planner. My 20 years of the Coast Commission set me up for everything else I wanted to do, whether it was political or the science I'm working on now about toxics. This look at the big picture, dive deep into the science or the wetland protection or whatever, then think about the policy and the big picture and what you're learning is all it's an it's an unforgettable and uh, amazing job to have is to work for the Coastal Commission. I'm so glad we're recording this. <laughs> um, Linda and Lee, you guys are in the same room together. So why don't you bring us home? <laughs> Go ahead, Lee. Well, the. Uh... Public service is a cornerstone and not just for the uh, life decisions I've made, but for everybody I've had the privilege to work with. And so uh, teamwork has been really key. Um, and also uh, sticking to your ideals. Eventually, uh, uh, you know, if uh, you know things go sideways uh, partway through or a hearing doesn't go the way you want, you'll get there eventually. A, a chief ranger at Point Reyes once said to me, he, you know, this is when we were negotiation, negotiating a big uh, uh, anti-development uh, contract, um, and it fell through. And he said, don't worry, Otter, we'll outweigh the bastards. And that's, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's good advice, because <laughs> if you stick to your ideals, you'll have a clear destination. And if you don't get it now, maybe you can get it 20 years from now. That's right. brilliant. Well, then I have the pleasure of going at the end of all of these um, people that have such wonderful, beautiful words to say. And I would say, you know, people ask me, people in this room here say, Linda, why are you still working here? It's been <laughs> over 45 years. It's because of what everybody just said. It's public service. It's dedication. It's knowing that the people of California demand that we implement the Coastal Act and say and believe that the coast is for everybody. And it's such a pleasure to be able to do that for your job, your career. Most people, I don't think they have that. And it's just a wonderful, wonderful thing. And um, I love working with everybody. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's absolutely wonderful. Um, Noaki, do you want me to start going through some of these questions? Sure. Great. Um, uh, well, first of all, Noaki, I'm, I see a note from you that says, Ashley has a good question. Look at my phone. I don't have anything <laughs> on my phone oh. <laughs> from Ashley. So maybe you can oh, start Oh, sorry. With I thought question. I sent it to you. Um, okay. So hold on. She says, um, 
I'm wondering if some of you could speak to how you see the future of coastal management in California, and especially as it relates to issues such as environmental justice and climate change that were not really part of the conversation in the 70s, um, and how you see the Coastal Act continuing to stand the test of time um, to grow, shape, and support our work in addressing these and ever-changing complex challenges. It's a big question. <laughs> This is a big question, and it's the first part is right. We did not, we're not told to, it wasn't part of the law to consider that. We we're just marching ahead, doing our thing. And the only thing that came close to me to EJ issues was affordable access to the coast and you know, low and moderate income visitor facilities uh, that wasn't really built into Prop 20, but clearly went into the Coastal Act. And we had grappled with all through the 1980s. And then today it's a different issue. You guys, you current staff know way more about it or taking care of that way more than we did 40 years ago, I can tell you. I'd just like to answer something to say. I would dispute the fact that the Coastal Act and stuff, you know, wasn't an issue of, of environmental justice because providing public access for all citizens, especially those who couldn't afford to be on the coast. The coast is the, the kind of one of the few places of absolute free public recreation for every citizen, no matter what your your economic status was was the cornerstone of the act. Secondly, I'd point out that one of the things that I think the that has occurred over the the many years of the Coastal Commission was was I think uh, uh, I think Bill raised the word just holistic of of trying to look at you know issues a, a, across an entire maybe ecosystem or a section of a landscape rather than just a more small narrow political issue. And uh, for most of the you know, about seventy about seventy five percent of climate adaptation is land use planning, and like it or not, still today seventy five percent of land use planning still occurs at a city and county level. That's where the land use decisions occur. But for climate change, we have to look across entire regions. For the Bay Area, we have to look at the entire nine county bathtub that has eight million people. And I think that the lessons that were kind of played out of looking across jurisdiction with the Coastal Commission are what are key towards dealing with climate adaptation issues, looking at entire watersheds, entire ecosystems. So I think there's a direct link between what the, the path that the Coastal Act and the, and the many planners have, have worked on to what we're dealing with now with looking at climate adaptation issues across the larger landscape. Scale. Yeah, I think we're, California is fortunate to have the coastal program in place because I think more than any other coastal state in the country, we're poised to do more on sea level rise. Um, Alex Helprin has a great question. Um, he mentioned, uh, he wasn't sure if somebody had said we had 16 commissioners on each regional commission, but we had eight regional commissions plus a statewide commission. That's something like 80 plus commissioners. His question is how how did how did they all get appointed and who mm. was their criteria for them who who were those people does anybody that's a lot of appointments to make in a short period of time if you think about it how does that well, roll out it's in I just read Prop 20 it was really similar today it was all half local government and then half public appointees and all and split three ways by speaker Senate pro tem okay. and the governor still exists today okay so, so and that's how it worked and the local government would elect one of their own with a hearing they would hold and send one to us. And the others were sometimes great uh, professional experts in things and other times just friends of friends and political appointees yeah. in terms of the public mentor members so, back then. So that's a great example of how Prop 10, 20 basically set the stage for what later became the Coastal Act. It's still yeah, essentially- It worked, it worked pretty well, but it was that half local that was essential. Which it we, still is half local. The other part of my question was, you know, had. Had Reagan taken a position on Prop 20, what were the politics around those appointments like at that time? There's so much vetting and campaigning that goes into these appointments now. Um, well, we were luck we, I'll just say one thing. You know, Mel Lane, who was the publisher of Sunset Magazine, was a very close friend back, back when there were actually moderate and, and liberal Republicans. I think Mel Lane was what you would just, you know, will call a liberal Republican. And basically, Mel Lane was the Reagan whisperer. He was able to um, talk Reagan down and explain things to him. And uh, he he was a an enormous ambassador. I think there's a um, probably not enough gratitude that may be offered to how uh, uh, what Mel Lane did to to maintain um, the the governor uh, and hold him back from reacting to all of his uh, other more selfish uh, uh, players. He was a very visionary. He he could talk conservation and in a 
because he was a publisher of Sunset Magazine, which extolled the tourism industry and the lifestyle of California, he was able to um, be a, a very powerful representative to uh, Republican leadership at the time. Great. Yeah, P Peter has mentioned that too, that he wasn't a fan of Prop 20, but once the initiative was passed, he was like, okay, it's the law, it's what Californians want. And he was actually a good mm -hmm. governor for that first, those first early years. Um, I just want to mention quickly that Annie has dropped some links into the chat for some of these um, archival documents, including the um, the campaign contribution statement for the No on Prop 20 campaign. Uh, encourage folks to take a look at that at your leisure. You will see some very, very familiar names on those big contributors to No on Prop 20 because there are a lot of the um, entities and institutions that we still deal with today. Um, Ellie had a question, uh, Ellie on the North Coast had a question, which is who's responsible for our incredible definition of development in the Coastal Act? No, that, that was pretty much Peter and uh, people writing and starting out with what was in Prop 20 and the other legislative, I mean, he was charged with doing the language and then it was language that was fought over by with a lot of people, but that 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 was that was his vision and bcdc had some of that yeah. too. dredging was a big one touching you know wetlands water came out of bcdc and that that underscores like peter was the principal author of prop 20 and one then he was also the principal author them, yeah. of the coastal act and then he was also ultimately the commission's legislative director so he's he's got more of a footprint i think on the program than uh, than any other um, single individual. Um, Sean Drake had to go, but he had a question about when were the regional uh, commissions disbanded? Well, they kept extending them. They were supposed to go out in 78, was it? Or 80? Right. There were bills 80. 80. There were bills in the legislature that kept extending them. Nancy had her hand up. Mm -hmm. Oh, I didn't see that. Nancy. They went out in 19, they went out in 1981. They were, they, they were legislative out because I was in statewide appeals and we suddenly became the only appeals unit. I mean, the only permit unit then. So it was 1980-81. But I think they were supposed to go out in when the Coastal Act was passed and then they get up oh, two more years, up oh, two more years because there was so much work to do. They, there's so many permits. I used to do when I was hired full-time in 77, we were, and Rick Hyman is on this too, we were doing, Linda, we were doing like 20 permits every two weeks. Yeah. That's how bad it was in terms of workload. Yeah. Um, so Tom Lester asked me to let folks know that um, there was an obituary in the, um, um, the Press Democrat this morning about the passage of Lucy Cordum, mm. who was Bill Cordum's wife. And Linda, I saw the reaction on your face. Do you just want to take a moment and talk about Bill and Lucy Cordum and what their contribution was and what that means? Well, Bill Cordum, Bill and Lucy, um, like there's a trail in Sonoma Coast State Park named after Bill Cordum for all of his work on, um, what was it called? Save the Coast Initiative at, you know, before Prop 20 and just a super strong supporter of creating the coastal initiative and and it all comes from there from Sonoma the birthplace of protecting the coast because of the sea ranch that was mentioned right at the beginning of this discussion where 10 miles of public coast or coast was walled off to the public and um, Bill was just an incredible man with a lot of incredible vision um, and he brought so much energy to ensuring that we had a good coastal program. Um, and I had the pleasure of walking on a number of coastal hikes with him, um, including the whole backbone trail in Santa Monica Mountains. Um, so um, a great was, guy. He was really uh, one of the initial instigators of the whole concept of the California Coastal Trail too, wasn't he, Linda? Yes, he was. And right. we have a hat right here next to me. I, I don't know <laughs> if you can see it. We have a coast small hat. <laughs> Anyway, well, that's you guys are like our prop team. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're the swag you know, department. <laughs> right. Um, so. uh, Mark uh, well, Mark Johnson had something he wanted to add on San Onofre. I think he's got issues typing into the chat. So, Mark, do you want to unmute and and uh, Mark Mark, you're on mute. You need to unmute. Mark, you're on mute. You need to unmute. 
<laughs> uh, next okay, question. Can you, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I I had been muted from the control before. Okay. Well, um, it is after spending almost 20 years at the Coastal Commission, I just have to first say that it is so great to hear all my old friends and to hear all of the um, history and stories that I've heard before, but to hear them from the people who were really instrumental in developing the Coastal Commission before I got there in around 2000. Um, I just wanted to, I mean, at the risk of being self-congratulatory, um, I think we've done phenomenal things, but there is still so much to do. Um, and I'll just focus on one aspect of this. This is not my most important subject, but there was a lot of talk about it that um, a lot of people um, were very concerned about it. And that's about San Onofre and Diablo Canyon. And they're right up there in the um, headlines nowadays. Um, I, in the interest of time, I won't talk about San Onofre, but it's ridiculous that we were, well, that we didn't have a political choice except to allow a nuclear waste depository within 10 feet of the surf. Um, Diablo Canyon, as you probably know, um, has just gotten a billion, one billion dollar tax-free um, grant to be secured for another five years. And we had already fought that battle, uh, not just us, but the um, Environmental Defense Funds and, as well. And Diablo Canyon was to be shut down. Um, nuclear power plants on the coast is just the most egregious, in my opinion, um, environmental concern. And we need to be, in my opinion, we need to be more proactive in stopping that. Yeah, for thanks instance, for that, Mark. I think we all really uh, agree with you. That is a classic example of one of those times when, you know, politics really sort of forged the the outcome. We were, we were, we actually did some really high quality damage control on the bill that relates to Diablo Canyon. I won't go into it now. I've briefed the commission and the public during um, public session in the ledge report, but you, you know, it's not, it's not our world to make, right? It's just our world to try to make better where we can. And so Diablo Canyon is an excellent example of that. Trust me, that bill would have been far, far worse if it weren't for the participation of Jack and Kate and our chair, Donna Brownsey, and, um, you know, some other good advocates that we were- Susan Jordan. I Susan worked on Jordan. The, I worked yeah, on the Kim, bill. Kim Delfino, the bill. absolutely. You got the coastal thing out. Right? Yeah. It, it would have been way, way worse. Um, I've got a question here from the South Coast. Again, I don't know if really anyone is going to be able to answer it, but maybe you can. Um, they're curious about the politics around the development of the Coastal Act chapter that applies to ports. Does anybody recall any of the converse, the early conversations about how ports were dealt with? So I'm wondering sure. if I might have been associated with the coastal dependent industrial override, which was one of the fallouts from San Onofre. Um, but I'm sorry, I just, I don't think there's anyone here on the call that actually. I mean, the, the ports were like other industrial development that in order to get the Coastal Act passed, there had to be sort of special treatment for the ports and the whole override, pos the potent, the part of the Coastal Act that allows override for coastal dependent industrial use. Those were compromises that were put in to keep the economic structure of the state moving forward in the eyes of the people in Sacramento. Exactly right. 
Thanks for that, I, Susan. I just want to add, I think, you know, if there's one famous kind of Peter Douglas quote was that, you know, the coast is never saved. It's always in the process of being saved. Mm -hmm. And I think over the years, the professionalism of people that, that staff the Coastal Commission have provided a body of data and science that makes it um, very difficult to do damage to the coast. There's always enormous political economic pressure, but the amount of, of data and science and information and precedent that has been provided by staff on the on the commission over the years has built a, a body of information that justifies the type of visionary planning that has occurred and I think continues to to occur and continues to sort of fulfill the vision of the Peter Douglases, the 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 Cordums, the the Ellen Stern Harris's and the many, many people that that worked and continue to work over the years. So I, I just want to, as we get towards the end of this, just say thank you as a as a a, a point of just enormous gratitude. Uh, uh, to me, the words public servant are are two of the most important words in my vocabulary, and I hold them in, in the highest regard. And I think for all of you that have worked in the past and those of you who are working daily, uh, uh, please know that there are millions of people in California who are extraordinarily grateful for you and for the public service and the vision and the integrity that you bring to your job every day. Thank you. Aww, thank you for that, Warner. You. That's really sweet. That chokes me up a little bit. And now <laughs> with our tribal consultation and EJ policy, we've got a whole new um authority to to yeah. really hopefully you know and that good yeah, staff work is one reason why we were so yeah. successful in the courts because we would go in the court here's the law but here's the proof we were really good at showing the resource the science the possible damage yeah. the mitigation on paper yeah so the that, evidence the evidence really yeah. matters um True. and just to pipe in to thank the environmental activists like warner and all the people we couldn't do it without that yeah. juicy enthusiasm from environmental activists, because as staff people, we couldn't have that same role. We could push the envelope and we could be aggressive in our policy places, but we had to follow the law. Susan, thank you so much question. for adding it's that. Such, that is it's so important. I, I'm like forever, ever, ever grateful um, to every activist I've ever worked with. And uh, it, it's a it's a giant collaborative team effort. Thousand percent. Um, that is a great uh, wrap up. We're at the one thirty hour, but I will say there's one last question in the chat. And Jack, if you don't mind, I think I'm going to direct this one to you. I'm going to put you on the spot. You've gotten to coast for the last ninety minutes, so <laughs> oh, <laughs> maybe that's unusual for me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sure it was a great, uh, a great relief. But um, the question is, what do you foresee for the future of the California coast, especially in light of issues such as sea level rise? So what's your vision for the future, Jack? Well, I, you know, just reflecting back on what everyone said, it's, it's, it's a thread that runs through our, our, our history of strong ocean and coastal protection and access for all. That just continues on. And this passion and active spirit, I think that it runs through all of us and why we do this work. So yes, we have huge challenges coming forward and issues that we've never had to face before. And it's gonna take really a lot of creativity. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty around it, but you know, I am really, um, I'm really hopeful and, and I think and I always, and I, I've said this to staff before, what a privilege it is to be at this place at this time to help shape California's future in a crisis, a climate crisis that we're in and the crisis around sea level rise. Um, it, is, it is a huge challenge, but you know, we're up for that challenge. We always have been up for that challenge. We're a small but scrappy and um, brave and bold agency. And you know, I have great hope for the future. And I, the reason I have great hope for this for a future is because of the incredible staff we have right now, and um, their and and the long legacy that you know it's going to be their responsibility going forward to carry on that legacy. When I was appointed executive director, that was the one thing that uh, probably weighed on me most heavily was continuing that that strong legacy of coastal protection, 
and being a strong independent staff um, who's driven by, you know, sound science, the facts and the law. So anyhow, thank there you, you go. so much, Jack. Thank you for that. We're going to miss you for real. Oh, that's sweet. <laughs> Um, I think uh, it's we I just can't leave today without thanking all of our um, Coastal Commission colleagues emeritus who joined yeah. us today. Um, really great to see your faces. We hope your retirement is going well. We hope you're getting ready to wade back in as volunteers for issues in your <laughs> communities. <laughs> or as mentors. We'll talk about that soon. Yeah. We're Say retired. the word. Yeah. And then, of course, thank you to the panelists. I mean, you guys are, you're walking institutional memories. You're just invaluable to keeping the history of the Coastal Act and the Coastal Commission alive and living and relevant. So thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join us. Nawaki, any closing thoughts? No, just thank you. This was such a special way to spend 90 minutes and really just, you know, I think made my month. So thank you very much. We Keep got saving it, you youngsters. I want you to save it for us old folks. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna leave the meeting open for a few minutes. So people who haven't had a chance to open and download some of the material in the chat uh, that's in Dropbox, you'll have an opportunity to do so. But other than that, Good luck with the rest of late mailing and uh, we'll see you on the other side. Bye-bye everybody. Things never change. <laughs> Hi Liz. Good to see you. I haven't seen you in a long time. Hi Nancy. Yeah, Annie, you want to unmute everybody in case people just want to chat? Hi Barbara. It's, it's wonderful to see people. Yeah, same here. Do it again. Do it again. <laughs> you, you Coastal Commission Emeritus folks, you should be organizing these, uh, you know. <laughs> oh, no. Get together. Oh, no. Happy you do hours. it on state time. Do it on state time. We're, we're on retiree time. <laughs> <laughs> uh.